Hello, thank you all for patiently waiting. Um, why don't we get started on our webinar today. This is uh, Tony Chow from Cancel. We would like to welcome you to the webcast. Kim Renshaw from Autodesk will be discussing today's technology trends with details about the new Autodesk subscription model. This webcast is being recorded and will be posted to our website afterwards. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the question section within the control panel. We will be monitoring the panel and will be responding during the presentation. A little background information on Kim. She is a graduate of Ohio State University and a practicing architect for 14 years. She then joined Autodesk in 1999 and over the past 15 years, her career has included roles as an AEC specialist, AEC sales, and today is the director of North American Bar Channel, working directly with resellers like Cancel and Solitad. At this time, I'd like to now pass this presentation over to Kim, and we will re review a few questions in the end. Well, thank you, Tony. And it's a pleasure to join Cancel for this webcast. And as you shared, I'm just going to take a few minutes and talk very briefly about some of the trends within the AEC market and some of the disruptions we see taking place, general trends within technology in general, and then really spend most of the time talking about Autodesk's transition to a subscription-based business. And of course, trends that are taking place, I could spend a lot of time talking about that. So do, you know, stay tuned for more information, presentations on really the future of making things coming from Autodesk and Can't Sell. But for today's call, again, from a high level, I, I really want to talk about how technology has always disrupted how things have been made. And disruption isn't necessarily a negative word because it drives changes in processes. It brings in new opportunities that didn't exist before. And many times, these disruptions can happen at a very fast pace. You know, we've seen this throughout history. But something that is really kind of unique is now that these disruptions are also changing how products and spaces are used, how things are sold, as well as how they're serviced. Now, from a broad scale, we can see multiple examples of this. And if we look at small devices, maybe that are custom tailored to consumers, like medical devices, we see that today they're actually able to be produced one-off very cost efficiently and very quickly. We see companies like Rolls-Royce with their Power by the Hour program and how they're changing the fundamental business model related to actually selling jet engines. And then as we look at AEC, we see how Google is selling Nest not because they want to sell more thermostats, but instead they see Nest as a piece of the connected home and a way to expand their reach. Clearly, technology advancements have the potential to impact a wide range of businesses, including your business. Because of these disruptive technologies taking place, buildings are also changing themselves. Physical things are connected more to one another, becoming deeply interconnected systems. Physical things and the digital, or I should say the physical world, and the digital world are really becoming interconnected, which is really creating new opportunities to add value to built assets or spaces. The Nest thermostat, which I briefly referenced, actually learns an occupant's behavior and offers better environmental control and energy efficiency. This data-driven insight about how we use the space is scaling up to environments even like the Midfield Airport Terminal Building in Dubai, which uses sophisticated technology for innovative baggage handling, duty-free item sales, as well as efficiently processing passengers. It gives us a way to respond to the demand for high performance across so many dimensions. Occupancy levels, energy performance, water usage, these are just a few examples. Now, these connected systems will create opportunities for building owners and occupants, designers and contractors, as well as product manufacturers, literally the entire ecosystem, and provides opportunities to extend their collective capability. In the future, buildings and their elements will generate streams of data, and these objects will be the data from which analysis will be used to form connected systems of insight as we continue to improve efficiencies and design. We'll understand how through these linkages, how spaces and structures perform via systems, both whether they be environmental or even economical. We'll have more insight and control from any place at any time. And this is key to understand. 
and will have control on whether it's to reduce energy consumption, build more efficiently, or even create and design more responsive spaces. The vision actually can be as large as the consumers and our clients want them to be. The key takeaway for you to have today really is we see today the big impact that each small decision we make today in design, in construction, in the operations of facilities, as well as its, in its occupation, the impact it has going forward. Now underlying these changes right, are some issues that you really should be looking at also from a business perspective. And that's really about what technologies are you using, are you as competitive, not just today, but are you preparing yourself to be competitive in the future as these disruptions take place. You know, some of your clients or customers may not be leveraging the data or these interconnected systems today as I've talked about, but they will be in the next in the near future. So you always want to make sure, and this is a key component I'd like to make, is that you're looking at how you're using technology, how you're changing your processes, and how you're becoming nimble to adapt. You know, as we look at the software, we also look at, excuse me, as we look at the disruptions that's in the uh, market, we also look at the software. And there's brings changes within the software itself also. At Autodesk, we divide what we've seen in terms of the evolution of technology of design software into three technological eras. The era of documentation, optimization, and connection. The era of documentation was focused on digitizing existing processes and managing the data that resulted. It provided efficiencies but did not provide fundamental changes to the processes. The era of optimization provided new ways to solve problems that could not be solved effectively with traditional development and prototyping processes. This allowed companies to increase their capabilities and reduce costs and time to market. Now the third era, the era of connection, and this is the era that we have entered into currently, is the era of connection meaning extending the ability of companies to connect their business processes and collaborate with stakeholders, and to change the way they operate, to transform from product-only businesses to an enterprise model where products become platforms for services. You know, we see this today in many either architectural or design or engineering firms where actually after the building has been built, designed and built, and delivered to the owner, many of these same firms are extending their services in terms of facilities management or the ongoing update and maintenance of those, of those uh, buildings. Again, extending their reach. Now, when we talk about the different eras, it's important to recognize that each era incorporates the era that came before. It's not as if documentation goes away when a company adopts optimization. And similarly, a company that moves into the era of connection still optimizes products during development. Now, the key takeaway for you here is what is changing is that the capabilities you need to compete are ramping up. I talked a little bit about some of the disruptions and of what technology can do within markets and what it means for building design and construction. So let me drill down just a little bit further. You'll probably hear and see many discussions around buckets of, uh, of information around the production, the demand, or the products. We see these as the three major disruptions that are catalyzing really a new era for the built environment. Now, what I mean by production is how we think about and deliver buildings, both intellectually and physically. Both of these are changing. There's a shift in our attitude about what intellectual property means, about who contributes to it and who owns it. Cloud and mobile technology means we can design anywhere and everywhere and with anyone we choose. Now, when we talk about the nature of demand, by this I mean how customers want to interact with their space how occupants drive what they need in a building, and what we produce in a design. All three of these are also evolving. Clients want high quality projects that benefit from collaboration and achieve an excellence and a balance between costs, project risks, and rewards. Now the third bucket is products, and by that I mean the buildings, the, and not just the buildings really alone. It could be the building in its entirety, it could actually be a system, and it also includes the assets, as well as the designs we use to construct them. 
what we're seeing is a huge change in production, nature of the demand, and the definition of products. And this is really happening because the digital and the physical worlds are becoming much more deeply intertwined. Now, because this disruption comes about, and we, again, have seen this historically, it also brings along and creates a new era of competition. And this era of competition can, again, be bucketized or categorized into four areas. One is unlimited access to processing power that will be able to solve the most complex problem. In fact, an unlimited processing power will probably be required to solve many of our problems going forward in design. There'll be seamless connection of talent so that the best ideas can come forward and are considered. We'll see a freeing up of capital by reducing risk, and it will also make possible access to sources of alternative financing like crowdfunding. And we'll also see intelligent digital connectivity of buildings and how this is going to unlock new forms of value moving forward. Now, another key takeaway is that these capabilities are going to be available to any company, regardless of size, type, or location. The barriers to access will be low. Now, in this new world, subscription is also becoming the new norm. And this is not unique to Autodesk or even unique to software companies. In fact, many of you actually may even be leveraging or taking advantage of this in your personal lives. You know, we've seen where in newspapers where people still can traditionally have a newspaper, newspaper delivered to their door and read it over a cup of coffee. More and more people are subscribing to the digital version, to the digital data, so that they can access their local news when they want it and how they want it, whether they're at home or on the other side of the world. We also see a shift in how people are accessing entertainment. You still can go down to a brick and mortar store and see if the most current or popular movie that you want to watch is available for rental. But sometimes that movie wasn't available. Sometimes you'd change your movie night or you'd watch something different. But again, more and more people are subscribing to streaming services that allow them to access the information that they want, when they want it, and how they want it across whatever device it is that they want to utilize, whether they're at home, at a friend, or in a hotel room on the other side of the world. The third example, and the last one I want to share with you, because it really addresses the ability of devices and mobility, is really around the use of what many people use of a navigational system. You know, a few years ago, I purchased a car, and I had a navigational system put in it because there's heavy traffic in my local city. And I've used it and had great benefit from it. But you know, I had to be sitting in the car to figure out what was the best route to take, when should I leave for a meeting. And in the last number of years, I've actually started to use the same technology, but now on my smartphone. So I can actually be sitting in my office and looking at traffic patterns, figuring out routes, and knowing when I should leave, with my me leave for a meeting and not be tied to my car. There's great benefits and advantages, even just to the mobility of accessing same information, but a different way. So what's true and what many of us have benefited from in our personal lives is also true in the business world. And so now I'd like to transition and talk about the Autodesk subscription model, what we have been doing and what we're doing next and moving forward, and some key important dates for you to note. You know, Honored Desk has provided subscription services to our permanent licenses via maintenance subscription contracts for quite a number of years. Originally, at one point, they were even called VIP contracts. So 10 years or more, this has been an option for our customers. A couple of years ago, we also introduced desktop subscriptions. And these are term-based licenses that are subscription-based and provide the same technology as the permanent licenses do. The third way we've introduced subscription is via cloud subscription. And we've brought new technologies to the marketplace via cloud subscription. Things like A360, Fusion 360, BIM 360, and so forth. And we'll continue to bring new technology offerings to the customers and to you, either via a desktop or term-based subscription, as well as a cloud subscription. So what I'd like to do is really spend most of the time talking about permanent licenses, the deadlines coming up, and contrasting a maintenance subscription contract value versus the desktop subscription contract. 
You know, as we talk about the trends and the disruptions within the market and the need for low cost of entry, more competition coming in, quick changes and access to barriers need to be lower. These are things that the desktop and the subscription model provide. So let me spend a little bit of time, again, contrasting and really kind of talking mostly about our maintenance contracts underneath a permanent license versus the desktop. So let's start with our permanent licenses, which is probably a model that the vast majority of you are familiar with. You've purchased a license that had a very high upfront cost. And then you have the option to acquire a maintenance subscription contract for that license going forward. And some of the benefits of that maintenance subscription contract brought you some basic support, the latest software, product enhancements, as well as another of other, uh, many other benefits. Probably one of the most popular, other than providing access to the latest release, has been the previous use, uh, use rights. So I will reference that several times because I know that's very key to many of our customers. Now the permanent licenses also were tagged to a device. So you downloaded it and it was tagged to a particular device. You could set it up on a network. And I'll talk more about networks here shortly. Uh, but it is tagged to a device versus a user. The software and the data is stored locally on that permanent license. And one of the things that I want to share with you is, well, actually, I should first acknowledge, many of you are probably familiar that last year we discontinued the ability to upgrade a permanent license. So really, the only venue to make sure you have access to the current release is via this maintenance subscription contract. And that started February 1st of this year. Now, I want to share with you that uh, many of you, or several of you on this call, in fact, even may have benefited from when they went to renew their maintenance subscription contracts, uh, may have renewed them slightly late or saw that there was like a grace period after the expiration date, or even maybe had a need to renew an expired contract several months later. Sometimes you may have even paid a late rene renewal fee to do so. As of January 3rd, 31st, we're aligning all of our subscription programs to work the same. Maintenance, desktop, and cloud, meaning just like with desktop and cloud today, maintenance subscription starting February 1st must be renewed on time. You could also renew them early, up to 90 days prior to the expiration date. If you have a maintenance subscription contract and you have allowed that to expire, the only way to access a license and make sure that it's kept current going forward will be under a desktop subscription model. If you keep your maintenance subscription contract renewed and renewing on time, because again, there will not be an option for a late renewal, you can continue uh, renewing your maintenance subscription contract for as long as you would like. And of course, you can use your permanent licenses, whether they're on subscription for maintenance or not, indefinitely. Now let me kind of contrast that and talk about the desktop subscriptions, where there are similarities and where there are some additional advantages. So first of all, unlike a permanent license, a desktop subscription license is really for a specific period of time. You can acquire a license for a 30-day period, a quarter, for a year. And just like a maintenance subscription contract today, you can extend a desktop subscription contract for two or three years by locking down today's pricing over the next two or three years. Now this brings a lot of flexibility in terms of if you uh, have an ebb and flow, say, with your staffing or with your project loads, and you need to staff up for a particular project, this model allows you to acquire licenses just for the amount of time that you need them and not have to carry the cost of keeping that license up to date when it's not in use for an extended period of time. You'll also see some advantages with the desktop in terms of it has a low cost of entry. As I talked about, the permanent license has a large upfront cost the desktop subscription initial fee is much lower. Now, the maintenance subscription fee is a little bit higher than, excuse me, the desktop subscription renewal fee is a little bit higher than the maintenance subscription. But because of that low cost of entry to access the software, it stays pretty constant then for your cost. But the value there is it allows you at a much lower a capital investment to 
pilot new technologies, bring and introduce new technologies for a specific project that you have, and again, being time bound. Now, when we look at the subscription benefit, they're the same. The same benefit that you experience and take advantage of underneath the maintenance subscription contract are available to you as a desktop subscription. So same things, you receive the latest software, you get product enhancements, as well as previous use rights plus more. It's the same version of software that you're using that someone is using as a permanent license. Now, one thing that is unique and it brings additional flexibility is a desktop subscription license is assigned and tagged to a user. So as a user, I can purchase a license and load it on as many devices, hardware components that I would like so that I can access the software when I would like to, when I want to. Now just like the permanent license, the software is downloaded to my device, I'm not working in the cloud, so the software resides on my device, my data resides in my device. Um, you may have a uh, internet or a uh, cloud access in your own organization, which you can certainly use, but you don't have to. And I continue working just as I would be with a permanent license. Now, just as many of you do with permanent license today, you go to the internet and you download your most current release and you install it when Autodesk has a new release for your product. With the desktop subscription product, and this is for a single user, which is what we're using today, or selling today, and I'll talk about network licenses in just a minute. Um, you go to the internet, you download your software, again, it resides on your hardware, you download your license, you activate it, and then you can disconnect from the internet and work for 30 days. About seven days out from that 30-day period, you'll get an in-software reminder to reconnect to the, soft, to the internet briefly, to reactivate and validate your license, and then you can disconnect and work for another 30 days. Now, if that model is not convenient for you, stay tuned with me for a few minutes, because when I talk about the subscription-based licenses in a network version, you'll see that you don't need to do that, and that might be a better model for you. Now, as we move forward, many customers will continue to work with their permanent or perpetual licenses. They'll keep those on maintenance subscription, and again, you can do that for as long as you would like. We'll also have customers who will move into a hybrid environment, meaning they have some permanent licenses, but they're also working with desktop subscription licenses, whether it be additional licenses to the software they're already using or additional technologies that they're bringing in to add to their processes. And of course, we already have many customers who are working completely on desktop subscription model. The choice is yours. Now here's a comparison because I know the benefits that subscription brings, particularly for maintenance, has been a concern for many customers as will they have the same benefits with a desktop subscription. From here you can see the answer is yes. And actually, again, the desktop subscription brings you more flexibility. Now take this opportunity to talk about a couple of things. Previous use rights are available under both subscription models. Your license under subscription allows you to have access to three releases back. If you are not on subscription, and this is particularly important for those that have permanent licenses, if you drop your maintenance subscription and no longer carry it, you lose your rights to previous version usage. You only then will have legal usage to the current, the most current release that you had purchased and paid for. Now, global use rights is another topic that comes up, and both subscription models, maintenance subscription and desktop subscription, allow customers global use rights, meaning you can use the software outside of your home country for 90 days in any given calendar year. If you need to use the software longer than 90 days, there are additional contractual agreements that can be put in place with Autodesk, and you can work with Cancel on this and they're called extra territory rights or global territory rights. Now, of course, you can see the extra benefit is called out here that you can pay for the software as you're using it, which is an option you have with the desktop subscription, not available with permanent licenses or maintenance. Now, you'll also see network licenses there, and it says coming soon under desktop subscription. So let me share with you some of the information that might be helpful for you as we move through the next few weeks. 
we're going to be introducing term-based network licenses. Um, the final name for this type of license hasn't been finalized, so for this presentation I'll just refer to them as uh, desktop licenses or term-based licenses. These will be available for you in the very near future, and I'll touch on that here within the next month or so. And you'll see that they bring the same benefits that your permanent network licenses do, as well as any of your permanent. The key question you're probably asking is, how is this going to work within my existing network, or how is this going to be able to, uh, how am I going to be able to get the flexibility I need? So with the term-based network licenses, you'll see that we will be utilizing the same licensing file, the same license file technology that we use today for our permanent network licenses we'll be using for our term-based licenses. So this means that you will be have be able to take network license files that can be merged between both permanent as well as term-based. In fact, you can run the same license files off of the same server. There's no reason to hold two different servers, one for permanent licenses and one for term-based. Same server, same licensing file technology, and in fact, you can use the same network license manager utility that you use today to manage your licenses. No additional utilities or management utilities will be needed. Now, in terms of the licenses, as I shared, currently today we share we sell what is called a single user desktop subscription product. As we introduce the term-based network licenses, you'll see that those will be available in only one, two, and three year terms. The 30 day and the quarter will not be available underneath a network model only as a single user. In fact, we'll be introducing these in terms of every individual software product that we currently have available as a permanent license will be made available via a network subscription. And the key thing to note it is that these products, the individual software products as term-based network licenses, will be available for purchase in the beginning of February. So I'm not sure, I don't have a specific date, it may not be the first week, but it'll be in the first part of February. Now here's a URL that you can always reference for additional information in terms of answering maybe some of your questions around network licensing changes. And this is posted on the Autodesk.com public website, and I know that your CanSell team can also help get you this information. Now I want to share a couple of key upcoming dates that I want to make sure uh, that you understand. I'm sure you're familiar with them, but I'd like to cover them anyways, just to be sure. The first date that's important is January 31st, so we're only a few weeks away. And this will be the last opportunity to purchase new permanent licenses of most of our individual solutions. So individual solution, you have a license, and it allows you access to one of our technologies. You have a license for AutoCAD, or you have a license for Revit. This really impacts any customers who would wish to be purchasing new software licenses and they want them to be permanent. You have until January 31st to do so. After that date, the technologies will be available to you underneath the desktop subscription model. And as I shared before, if you currently have permanent licenses, you can continue to use that software indefinitely. And it's very important if it's a value to you to make sure that you have the current releases as they're made, previous use rights, as well as the other benefits, keep your maintenance subscription contract current. Now here's a list of the products affected in the U.S. and Canada as of January 31st. And you can see that there's the majority of our individual products. Again at the bottom you see a URL that will take you exactly to this same list of products if you want to verify if your products are impacted by the January 31st date. If you do not see your products on this list, very likely they are impacted by the next upcoming key date, which is July 31st. And this will be the last opportunity to purchase a new permanent or perpetual software license for most of our suite solutions, as well as several more of our individual products. Same thing is true if you have suites permanent today, you can continue working on those 
And again, the key is to make sure that you keep your maintenance subscription contract renewed if that brings the value of having access to the current releases. Here's a list of products that are impacted by the July 31st date of 2016. So you've got a little over six months away. And these products, the design creation suites, as well as some additional individual products will be impacted. Now, a couple of other things I'd like to share with you. If you have uh, permanent licenses of any of these products that I have shown you, and they're standalone, and you would like to convert those to a network activated license, for the products listed here on the screen right now, you would need to do that network activation prior to jet July 31st. The products listed for the January 31st deadline, you would want to do your network activations before the end of this month. After those dates on permanent licenses, network activations will no longer be available. Your solution then is to do a term-based network license added to your network. Another note I'd like to make is that if any of these products that you've seen that you have that is a permanent license and it is of the current release, and it is not currently on a maintenance contract, and you would like it to be under a maintenance contract, you must do that by January 31st of this year. After that date, you'll no longer have the ability to add a maintenance subscription contract to a permanent license. Well, what I'd like to do now is just take a few minutes and hit some of the common or um, I guess most common questions I generally hear and hope to continually bring some clarity for you. You know, there's a lot of information out there, and I've shared some of the URLs, and it's hard in a tight time frame to be able to answer every question. So thank you to the Cancel team who's answering questions as you type them in and into the chat box. If we've got time, we can field some of them here. But um, please, the key is to work with Cancel to address your questions, because every business is unique and has unique situations. And it's hard to answer every one of those possible variations on a webcast like this. So I've already talked about how your permanent licenses are yours to continue to use. They're not going to disappear on you. And I've already kind of touched on how you can have a hybrid environment of both permanent licenses as well as term-based or desktop subscription licenses. But a common question that comes up is, what can I do with my permanent licenses after these deadlines, what if I want to do something different with it? I want to convert it or transition or what we at Autodesk call cross-grade it to a different technology. Well, let me walk you through a quick scenario. Let's say that you have a permanent license of AutoCAD today, and you want to be able to access a license of architectural desktop. I can do that cross-grade between now and January 31st, and I can transition or cross-grade for a fee, my AutoCAD license to architectural desktop. No problem. But what happens, say, February 15th, it's after the deadline, and we're no longer selling new perpetual licenses of architectural desktop. But that's what you want to have. Well, we still are selling perpetual licenses of our suites products, as well as several other individual products. As of February 15th, you still could convert or cross-grade your AutoCAD permanent license to another permanent license type, but only for those products that we're still selling. So the suite and some of the additional products. Architectural desktop would not be available, so your option then would go to a create and design one of our uh, building design suites to get access to the architectural desktop. Well, come, and you can do that between you can do that now, actually, until July 31st, but you certainly can continue to do that after the January 31st deadline coming up. But after July 31st, we're no longer selling permanent licenses, whether they be suites or that individual solution, so you no longer would have that opportunity to cross-grade it to another permanent license. Now, another question that comes up is, should I be stocking up on permanent licenses now? And the answer is, I can't really answer that for you. It's really key that you sit down and look at your business, where you expect growth, project peaks, and how you want to manage that with Cancel. 
they're a great team to be able to help you lay that overall strategy. Because it's a much more of a conversation than just about how am I going to subscribe to my software. It's really about what is my go forward strategy? How do I how are we going to stay competitive and differentiate ourselves? And what technology can we be leveraging today that maybe we're not in our current processes? So you may want to purchase some additional permanent licenses before these deadlines to add to your pool of licenses. Or you may say, we're fine with what we have, and we'll work forward with a hybrid environment. Both of those are very good and very viable solutions. The question is, what is the best solution for your organization? Now, we've touched on a number of the perks for subscription. And probably a key thing, because previous use is so important, I do just want to reemphasize, if you have a permanent license and it's on maintenance subscription, the maintenance subscription is what gives you access to earlier versions or previous use rights. If you let that subscription expire and you don't renew it, or if you don't have a contract on it on your permanent license at all right now, you no longer or do not have uh, legal right to previous use. So keep that in mind because I know that you know above and beyond getting the newest release of the software, that's probably one of the most popular and valuable benefits of your subscription contract. I already talked about being able to convert a standalone uh, permanent license to a networked permanent license. So I'll just reiterate that you want to make that transition for the products impacted January 31st prior to January 31st. And those products that are impacted by a July 31st date, in terms of no additional permanent licenses being available, you will want to do your network activation prior to the July 31st for those licenses. Now, when I talk about desktop, uh, the term-based um, or desktop subscription network licenses, I talked about those licenses introduced in February will be for the individual products that we currently sell as permanent licenses. Many of you are working with suite products in our design creation suites. And the question gets asked, are we going to provide desktop subscription offerings for our design suites that you currently have as a permanent license? What I can tell you today is Autodesk is committed to providing flexibility, flexibility in terms of how you access and how you leverage that software. So with the desktop subscriptions, we provide you the flexibility of uh, acquiring that software for 30 days, a quarter, a year, up to three years at a time. And we're also committed to allowing customers, as they do with our design suites, to be able to have a single license that provides them access to multiple products. We are committed to doing that, and we'll continue doing that forward. So stay tuned as we get closer to that July 31st date, and as information becomes available, more details will be revealed about that. So kind of as I look to somewhat wrap up, at least here, and then we can see if any other questions have come in, I have shared some high-level information with you about some disruptions and trends within the market, how the meshing of the digital and the physical uh, environments are really going to start generating high volumes of high value data around buildings and how people are using spaces and how we can manage them. Mobility plays into that. And you need to have that flexibility to access the data as well as software from anywhere at any time across a multiple number of devices for your convenience. I've also talked about a number of the things with the Autodesk subscription models. We've been going through this transition for the last two years and have a little bit less than a year ahead of us to go to complete the cycle. So we've tried to provide as much information as we can and give customers like yourself as much uh, runway to understand what direction we were taking and how that was going to benefit your organization. So you may be sitting there and saying, well, what should I do next? And I can sum it up in just a couple of really quick, easy points. One, I recommend that you always are reviewing technologies and making sure that you're leveraging what's available today and how it's available today to not just ensure you're competitive today, but you are have that capability to compete tomorrow. I also highly recommend that you work with your CanSell team 
set up a meeting with them to review your business specifics. And it's very important that you have the key stakeholders within your company included in that meeting. So what do I mean by that? If we're you're watching this webcast and you're not really concerned if software is purchased via capital expenditure or an operating expenditure or if that you're writing your software off against individual projects, you want to find out who is uh, concerned and who has interest in that in your organization and have them join this meeting. If you're not involved or responsible for the deployment or management of your licenses, then you would want to find or have a representative um, on that team also participate in this meeting. Now, good news, if you use the software, you're going to be using the same great software, whether it's under a permanent license or it's a desktop subscription license. And I just remember there was a comment I had made earlier um, that I want to talk about uh, very briefly, and I'm sorry I missed it to touch on it. Um, when I talk about uh, have somebody join the meeting about your deployment of software. If you recall earlier, I shared that our desktop subscription licenses right now are for single user and that uh, you need to ping into the internet every 30 days. For some people, that may not be a convenient configuration. So I think I may have failed to mention that on the term-based network subscriptions or our desktop subscriptions that will be networked uh, being introduced in February, those licenses operate the exact same way that your permanent licenses do today. So there's no need to be pinging the internet or having access to the internet to use those licenses. So you can see there's a lot of nuances and it really comes down to what is your company strategy, where do you see expected growth, what are you leveraging and how do you want to leverage technology. And that really lays a go forward strategy that can sell, can work with you and help you deploy on moving forward. So with that, Tony, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to come back in and see if there are any other questions that have come in or points that maybe uh, we could further clarify in our remaining time. Sure. Thank you, Kim. Um, so at this time, I just want to answer a couple of questions from the group um, we received. The first question we have is, if I own traditional perpetual sign alone licenses on a maintenance description, and want to convert at a later date to a, a perpetual network license, does model transition affect me? Uh, so so let me ask you, I'm sorry? Oh, Tim, um, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so if somebody has perpetual standalone licenses today, and I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that question, and they would like to do what in the future? So we would like to convert at a later date to perpetual network licenses. Does the business model transition affect me? Uh, it does because you would need to do that standalone transition to a net, a permanent standalone to a permanent network. You would need to do that, or the customers would need to do that prior to us discontinuing the selling of new permanent licenses. So I'm just going to flash back here. So for example, these licenses were no longer going to be selling permanent new seats as of January 31st. If you have a standalone permanent license of one of these products and you want to make it a permanent network license, you need to do it before January 31st. You will not be able to do it after that date. If you want to have a network license of that software after this January 31st date, you would need to be doing a term-based or a subscription-based network license. Same thing with the July 31st date applies if, if a customer has any of these products as a standalone permanent license and wants to make them network activated, they need to do that prior to July 31st. After July 31st, they will not have the opportunity to take a permanent standalone and make it a permanent network. Again, their option would be after this July 31st date to acquire a subscription-based network license. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps, Tony. And that's a great answer. And the second last question we have is: We own perpetual network licenses on active subscription. After the license model changes to desktop, what will happen to our network licenses? And can we add additional network licenses? 
Okay, so I think, uh, help me make sure I answer all these sections of the question. So if a customer has network licenses today, as I shared, it's the same network license file technology. Uh, you can merge termed-based licenses into your existing network. Um, you can work it on the same server. And after these deadlines, at any time, you can add what we'll be introducing as the individual product term-based network licenses. Uh, if you want to add additional permanent network licenses, you need to do them prior to the, to the two uh, dates that I just shared, the January 31st pro uh, date for that selection of products, and then the July 31st. So if you have a network today, you can expand it after these deadlines. You will just be adding in a termed base license, which would either be a one two or three year term to base license, which you could set up on renewal. And by the way, if you have maintenance contracts on any of your license, but in this in the question you asked me, Tony, if the permanent network licenses are on a maintenance subscription and you add some term based network licenses to the same network, same server, same license file, you can also co term both of those subscription contracts to expire at the same time so they're easy to manage. They will still be two separate uh, subscription contracts because one is maintenance and one is a desktop subscription, but you can co-term those so that they expire at the same time for convenience. So did I answer all of the components of that question? If I missed anything, please let me know and, and I'll answer that. Yes, you did. That's a fantastic answer. With that said, are there any further questions the group may have? Okay, so we'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be providing this recording through our CANSA website. A CANSA representative will follow up with the attendees to answer any further questions you may have. Thank you all.